This is not so complicated as I'm not going to compare different uh, treatment strategies. I'm just going to explain the five-year results on a single center trial that was uh, conducted by a large group of uh, people. I have a declaration that our, my institution is paid by um, the, uh, the things that I do for this in this trial. The group was um, a large group, so I would like to present on behalf of these Paragon investigators the uh, five-year outcome of the Paragon trial. This entire trial was uh, sponsored by Medtronic as we're evaluating the Avalis valve that was produced by Medtronic. They did the data analysis, but both myself and all the authors had full access to the data. The Pyrgon trial is um, um, a trial that included over 1,000 patients look at the safety and effectiveness of the Avalis valve. The primary outcome was the comparison of the linearized uh, rates of different safety outcomes uh, comparing to the uh, OPC values, the objective performance criteria set out in the ISO standards, and there were a lot of in and exclusion criteria. I've reported on this trial before, and I'm just going to summarize here. We can go to that later, but I only just have seven minutes that it captured about almost all daily AVR patients, but we wanted to exclude patients that had a prohibitive risk of dying before the end of the trial that would go on for 12 years, so we excluded endocarditis, double valve surgery, et cetera, but we included patients with cabbage surgery and other concomitant procedures. The trial was conducted in uh, 38 sites in Europe, Canada, and, and um, the United States and we reported on different uh, time frames. Very briefly go over the, uh, the details of these patients, over 1,000 patients, mean age of 70, male predominance, and an SCS risk score of about two, which is basically a low risk study group. 10% um, of atrial fibrillation, that's important when I come back to the bleeding events, and about half the patient had coronary artery disease. Most of the indication was uh, aortic stenosis. A surgical approach was 20 in 20 percent of the patients was less invasive. 32 percent underwent also com uh, concomitant cabbage surgery, and about uh, 15 percent other procedures like atrial fibrillation surgery and LA occlusion. Six percent at ascending aortic replacement. So it was a mixed bag of patients. To go to the results, the primary endpoints to the performance for the objective performance criteria, and you can see here the OPC's values and the linearized late rate event rate per year. And you can see that for both thromboembolism, uh, valve thrombosis, major peripheral leak, and endocarditis, they were all below the OPC threshold. This was not true for major hemorrhage. Um, that is most likely due to the fact that these OPCs were designed in a time where we wanted to compare mechanical valves versus biological valves, and obviously the advantage of biological valves is that they would have less bleeding events than mechanical valves. But as in this all-comer trial, a lot of these patients already had anticoagulation before the operation and even got more anticoagulation after the operation, both for atrial fibrillation and coronary artery disease. So there was a significant amount of patients, over 50%, at discharge that had anticoagulation, and still at one year, more than 20% of the patients were on anticoagulation. Now, the uh, freedom from event rate was used by using Kaplan-Meier analysis, and we looked at these uh, durability events, the non-structural valve deterioration, structural valve deterioration, and three patients with severe hemodynamic dysfunction, which are not yet adjudicated to whether they had structural or non-structural valve deterioration. I come to that in a second. We saw no patients with SVD, zero at five year. And there were some patients with non-structural valve dysfunction. And these three with severe hemodynamic dysfunction were three patients. One had endocarditis and happened to remain with a significant stenosis after uh, the treatment of the endocarditis. Uh, we are not sure whether that could be classified as SVD. We don't think so. There was another patient with valve thrombosis, and that resolved with anticoagulation, but still the uh, clinicians decided to put a TAVI in that patient. And uh, we, we think that that is also not an SVD. And the third patient, we couldn't find the details yet. It's still in analysis. 
The re-intervention uh, curve is uh, down here. This is an instantaneous hazard curve. As you can see, there is a little bit more re-intervention in the beginning, uh, but you can see that it's constant over time and very low. There were in uh, total 31 re-interventions within the first five years. 27 were redo surgeries, mainly because of uh, endocarditis and uh, four uh, transvalvular ATAVI procedures, valve in valve procedures. The uh, performance, the hemodynamic performance is listed in this table where at different time points you can see the different colors uh, ranging from 19 to 29 millimeters and there are two important things to see here that the gradient over time is stable in each valve size and that the gradient itself is rather low except for the smallest valves, but still acceptable, I think, between 15 and 20 meters mercury, but it doesn't seem to increase over time. The valve, the patients performed very well. The, uh, the, the um, improvement in NYH class, as you can see, from baseline to three to six months is maintained over time. In blue, it's NYH class one. It's about three quarters of the patients and it re remained in NYH class one over the five years. And about 23% of the patients in NYH class two. And remember that a lot of these patients had concomitant diseases that could explain why they're not in NYH class one, like atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, etc. And the last slide I wanted to show you is the survival rate, and this also shows why it's important to uh, study this trial in more depth, because we see here a 1,000 patients, contemporary AVR population, with an excellent survival of 88% at five years, and a valve-related and cardiac uh, survival of uh, about 98% at five years. And this, uh, this trial, therefore, shows not only the performance of this valve, but also what we can achieve in these uh, this modern age in uh, replacing the aortic valve with a surgical uh, AVR. So in conclusion, I think this um, study shows that there's an excellent uh, valve durability with no cases of SVD at five years. The reintervention hazard was low over time and constant, and improvements in mean gradient and functional status were very stable over time. The survival rate was high and the performance against the OPC standards, which was the primary goal of this, these, of this uh, study, remained good over time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, excellent, excellent results. It's uh, astonishing high survival after five years, isn't it? Yes, and these patients were not young. And we're not always easy to operate. And I think with modern technology, this is show what we can achieve. And this is probably, there's another trial from Edwards with the Resilia valve that shows very similar results uh, in terms of uh, outcome. And therefore, I think that should be the, the gold standard to which other treatments need to be compared. Um, so, Patrick, do you think that is convincing enough to use the valve? Is it? I think it's convincing, but um, we still need the, the very long-term follow-up. Of course, it's very important data to have. Um, the Toronto valve looked great until seven, eight years, and then it suddenly dropped off. Agreed. Um, maybe there, there's one question is, uh, I maybe missed this or didn't understand. Uh, if I understood well, there were three uh, NSVD um, events or something like that, the way you calculated your, your freedom from SVD, NSVD. Then you have 31 reinterventions, 27 for endocarditis. Um, what, what are the reasons for reintervention if you're not having issues with the valve? They were probably all were endocarditis. Okay. Uh, yeah. There were actually 42 cases of endocarditis, so more than is listed here for reoperation, but a lot of the patients, or some of the patients that had endocarditis were treated medically and not uh, by resurgery, reoperation. Okay. And it's, uh, they're probably too old for reoperation or another reason. Mm -hmm. And I fully agree that uh, this, this trial will run for 12 years, and I wouldn't uh, bet on the durability unless we go for 10 years or beyond. But still, it's promising. It's encouraging. Absolutely. Thank you. Any and statistical issues? <laughs> <laughs> it's a single arm, so. <laughs> I was struggling with the annual rate and the, uh, and the Kaplan-Meier analysis. They're not completely the same, but for the OPCs, we had to evaluate it in this way. I mean, yeah, with the data you have, you can at least um, 
where you cannot say a lot about halt or thrombosis on the valves, but uh, at least the gradients are stable. And exactly. So exactly. I think that's yeah. a good signal. Okay. Any other comments, questions? I guess if you want a statistical um, comment, um, <laughs> I guess the, there's a competing risk issue here, isn't there? Because um, a valve can fail um, or somebody can die and presumably you're censoring patients at the point that they die. Um, um, and the death could actually be related to the valve. You've no way of disentangling no. that um, directly. Um, you may be able to, to ascertain some of that. So I wonder what you plan to do about that, because right now the event rate is, the death rate is low, um, but we're at five years and you've described an elderly in front. There's, there's, you, you can almost measure the um, it's remarkable feeling in the room that the death rate is so low. But so by 12 years, it will have gone up quite a lot, won't it? So what are you going to do then? Yeah, well, I, I think our next analysis will be a competing risk analysis. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you, you cannot get and handle all these, uh, th these different issues that interact with each other. Mm -hmm. So that's probably what we'll do.